Good stuff. We're looking at the neurovasculature of the trunk. So to begin with, we're looking at an anterior view of the thorax and upper abdomen. Some of the structures have been removed, so we can see that the anterior parts of the lungs have been taken out, which makes it easier for us to see the heart and some of the major vessels here. So to begin with, the aorta. Now please remember this session, you do need to state which part of the aorta has been pinned. So the ascending part is just this first bit here after it comes out of the left ventricle or after the blood comes out of the left ventricle. Then the arch is the curved bit. Now this model, possibly not the best one to do the curved bit, but you can see it here. Okay, you can see that there's a curve there once the heart's been removed. And then there's the descending thoracic, which is the straight bit in the thorax. And then further down on this model, I'll just shift it up a little bit, we have the abdominal aorta. So once we're through the diaphragm into the abdominal cavity, then it's called the abdominal aorta. Okay, so that's what we're looking at there, four bits of the aorta. So if it's curved, that's the arch, okay? If it's straight up or straight down, it's either ascending or descending thoracic. Now from the arch of the aorta, coming off the superior aspect of the arch, firstly, on the right hand side, we have the brachiocephalic trunk. And we can see that in two places on this model, but note that it's covered by a brachiocephalic vein here. So we can't see all of it. So there's part of the brachiocephalic trunk, there's another part. And then of course it splits into the right common carotid artery, which runs up the neck to the head, and the right subclavian. Now we can see the start of the right subclavian just here. We can see a little bit of it here between the, a vein and a muscle. And we can see a tiny bit more of it here, but what happens to it just here? It ends and changes its name, yeah, from um, subclavian to axillary. This is the lateral border of the first rib. So the subclavian is not very long, okay? That's the right subclavian artery there. We can only see bits of it, but we can see it. Then the next branch to come off the aorta, the left common carotid, again, traveling up the neck to supply the head. The next one over, the left subclavian. So on the left hand side, there's no brachiocephalic artery or brachiocephalic trunk, okay? They're just two branches that come off the arch straight away, they're left common carotid, left subclavian. Again, we can see the left subclavian over this way. We can just make it out there in between a vein and a muscle. But by the time we get to here, it's actually past the lateral border of the first rib which means we're kind of, there's only the tiniest little bit of subclavian here, and after that, we're into the axillary artery. So, I, and I will be really careful where I pin those if I pin them. All right, so that's the major arterial branches we can see there. What, uh, the one that um, we can't see on this model, but we can on another, is the vertebral artery. Now, sorry, I'll just lay this model over the top. Um, hope that looks all right. So we saw this model last week, and of course what we're looking at is the sternum here and the, and the costal cartilages. So we have a clavicle on this side. What we can see is the uh, brachiocephalic trunk just here, and then this would be the right common carotid. So this one here is the right subclavian artery, and then this branch coming off it and heading superiorly is the vertebral artery. So that would be the right vertebral artery. And you can see it going in here through the transverse foramen there of C7. And if we look at the other side, if we look at the left-hand side, we can't see where it arises because uh, there's no subclavian artery here. But here we can see the vertebral artery running up through the transverse foramina. And what's really cool about this model is it gives you a good idea of exactly where it runs. Um, if we look up here behind the occipital bone, or just under the occipital bone, if we just move the, the C1 spinal nerve out of the way there, there you can see the vertebral artery running around the back of C1 and doing a, a 90 degree turn. 
So it, it's heading vertically up through the transverse foramina and then it does a 90 degree turn and heads horizontally and then joins up with the one from the other side in front of the brainstem to form the basilar artery. Now, what that means is there's a big kink there in the vessel and this is the one we were talking about in the tube the other day. If you lie with your um, neck slightly extended and laterally rotated, that exaggerates the, the two kinks that you've got there even more and can compress that, that artery quite considerably and cut off a fair amount of the blood flow there. So that's what can cause a headache if you, lie, if you sleep facing down, so lying in a prone position. All right, so that's the major arteries there. Now, on some of the specimens, you may see the posterior intercostal arteries in between the ribs there on the posterior aspect. You, may, you will see the internal thoracic artery on, the, on an internal or interior view of the anterior chest wall there, either side of the sternum, but we don't have models that show those. The anterior intercostal is very small. They come off the internal thoracic, I don't know if we'll see them. We'll have a good look for them, but I don't know if we'll spot them on any of the specimens. So look for those other arteries on the specimens. Now, on the model again, for some of the veins of the thorax, firstly, the superior vena cava. And so here it is here, right in the middle. Now, the word for superior vena cava is short. It's only short. Okay, it's big, big vein in diameter, but it's only short. And it it forms, remember we talk about veins having tributaries, not branches, because the blood is flowing towards the heart. So the tributaries that feed into the superior vena cava are going to be the left and right brachiocephalic veins. So with the artery, the, the, there's only one brachiocephalic artery on the right, the brachiocephalic trunk. With the veins, there are two, veins a right and a left. So the veins are paired and balanced, the arteries not. Uh, in the brachia with the brachiocephalics. Now with the two brachiocephalic veins here, the tributaries that feed into them are going to be on the right side. We're going to have the right subclavian and the right internal jugular. So the internal jugular vein is running with the common carotid artery in the neck. The blood is coming down from the head into, once it joins with the subclavian vein, then we have a brachiocephalic vein. Now the one on the left the brachiocephalic vein is longer than the one on the right and it crosses over the trachea and the branches that come off the aorta to get to the right hand side of the heart. Now again of course feeding into it we have the internal jugular vein which is huge. When you see it on the specimens you'll really know if you're looking at a vein it's a very big vein and then we have the subclavian vein as well. So left subclavian and then of course if we come further down on this specimen, look, uh, keeping um, with the major veins, here we've got the inferior vena cava. Why is there a bit missing here? Go through the diaphragm? Yeah, it does, but that's not why there's a bit missing there. It goes through the liver. So the liver would be sitting right here and if we turn the liver over, liver over and have a look at the posterior point of view, that's the missing bit there. There's the inferior vena cava travelling through the liver. It's not completely enclosed, but nearly. So that's where we can see it there. So that's the inferior vena cava. Um, note that, of course, um, there are branches, uh, sorry, tributaries feeding into that. We'll have a look at those in a sec when we get to the um, abdomen. The, um, the other veins of the thorax, so that again the posterior intercostals we should be able to see on the specimens in between the ribs. The azygous vein, again we should be able to see that one, it would be on the anterior aspect of the vertebrae, uh, on a, on probably on a back specimen, but you need to obviously turn it over and have a look at the internal view, but I'm sure we've got a couple or at least one good azygous veins to look at. The internal thoracic we will see again, either side of the sternum on an internal point of view. And now let's have a look at the arteries of the abdomen. So firstly, abdominal aorta running right down the middle here once we get through the diaphragm. Note that there's a few branches here that are coming straight off the anterior aspect of the uh, aorta. 
the abdominal aorta. The first one, imme almost immediately you get through the diaphragm, is the celiac trunk. Now the celiac trunk has a few branches, we'll look at them in a sec. The next branch we see is the superior mesenteric, and that's just above this left renal vein here. So superior mesenteric, not far really from the celiac trunk. Then a bit further on, we have the inferior mesenteric, and it's a bit hard to tell from this model, although you, you can spot the difference. It is smaller, it's much, much smaller than the superior mesenteric. Now as well as that, of course, we're gonna have renal arteries going to the kidneys, quite a bit smaller than the vein. And then further down here between the superior and inferior mesenterics, we have the gonadal artery. Now, if you know you're looking at a female or male model or specimen, you can call them testicular or ovarian, but if you're not sure, then gonadal is the generic name. So that would be the gonadal, left gonadal artery there and the right one on the other side. Um, then there are lumbar arteries. Now we can clearly see them here, but I'm not sure how well the color's gonna show up on the, on the screen. But this is a lumbar artery right here, and just above it is a lumbar vein. So they're red and blue on the model. So when you're looking at the model, it's easy to tell. On the screen, the color doesn't appear to be showing up too well. So the red one is the more inferior one here. That's a lumbar artery. Just above it is the vein. Now then, of course, we have the um, common iliac arteries too. So here's the common iliac artery. They're the two common iliacs are the branches of the ab the, the branches where the abdominal aorta terminates. And when we get to the pelvis in a little while, we'll see that the external iliac is just the continuation of that common iliac. And the internal iliac, and I'll just move the model, the internal iliac is this one here. Comes off the common and then coming off the internal, and, uh, and again, looks very clear to me where I'm looking at it here, um, you can see the obturator artery here. I'm not sure how well it's showing up on the screen, but if you're looking at the model up close, it's quite clear that there's a red vessel here running along the superior aspect of the obturator internus muscle going through the obturator foramen in the obturator groove there, getting into the obturator canal. All right. So, those are the arteries that we need to look at. The, uh, oh, but before we finish that, let's have a quick look. If I put this part of the intestines back in, so we've got part of the large intestine here, uh, the duodenum here and pancreas here, and then the descending and then sigmoid colon here. Uh, also some mesentery, so some membrane and fat holding these blood vessels in place. So we can see all those things, but what we can see on the top of this part of the model are some arteries. So what we've got here, this artery here has come off the aorta, so that is the celiac trunk. So that's this branch that we saw here earlier coming off the aorta. So there we can see the celiac trunk and we can see that it splits in almost immediately into three branches. So one runs along the top of the pancreas here. That's the splenic artery that's heading out to the spleen, which is out here on the left under the diaphragm. So splenic artery there. The one that's coming up off the, the superior aspect there of the celiac trunk, that's the left gastric, and so that's going to the stomach. And then the one heading right is the hepatic. Now often that gets called the common hepatic, but it's down on your list just as hepatic. So I don't mind which you say, you can just write hepatic or common hepatic, either is correct. So that's that one there. It's gonna split into some other named branches later on, which you don't need to know, okay? So splenic, left gastric, and then hepatic or common hepatic. But there is another model that's just a little bit clearer. It's the same structures, but if you look at this uh, freestanding model, it's not part of one of the torso models. Again, we're looking at the pancreas. This time the spleen is attached. We've got the duodenum here. And so what we can see is the celiac trunk here coming from the aorta. 
only a little bit of the left gastric shown here so that's the superior part there that you can see and then we've got the hepatic or common hepatic here heading over towards the liver and the splenic running along the top of the pancreas now does anyone remember what that one will actually look like on a specimen the splenic artery yeah, it'd actually be curvy or, or uh, tortuous or wiggly, whatever you want to call it. It won't be straight like that. It'll, be, it'll have all kinds of bends in it. But the vein, which we can see very clearly here if we turn the model over to look at the back, the splenic vein, usually quite straight. So there's the splenic vein. And what this model is really, really great for is here we've got the inferior mesenteric vein coming up to join the splenic. So the inferior mesenteric vein joins the splenic. This vein here, tucked in um, behind the head of the pancreas here, is the superior mesenteric vein, which means the artery next to it is the superior mesenteric artery. Yeah, good, good. So there's the large superior mesenteric artery, supplies most of the intestines. There's the superior mesenteric vein. Once the superior mesenteric vein and the splenic vein come together, what do we have here? That one's the portal vein, sometimes called the hepatic portal vein. Remember, this is all deoxygenated blood, but nutrient-rich blood that's heading from the intestines to the liver. So this is the portal or hepatic portal vein that takes a lot of blood to the liver so that the nutrients can be packaged and sorted out but also any drugs or any um, foreign objects or any objects but any foreign matter anything needs to be detoxified can go there and be detoxified too now just one last thing while we've got this model and did I mention how much I love this model um, just here under the pancreas again with on an anterior point of view, that's again the superior mesenteric artery and vein. So, and you can see the superior mesenteric artery about, well, has given off a whole lot of branches. Remember, it supplies most of the intestines. And we do have a really great specimen where you can see that and see how big it is. So it's much bigger on the specimen. Okay, so that's that model there showing some of the veins and arteries of the abdomen. Now we already looked uh, at the arteries of the pelvis. The veins of the pelvis travel with the arteries. So the internal iliac, external iliac and obturator veins are all just the blue ones that are next to the arteries. So they're all in exactly the, the same spot. And make sure that you look at the specimens to, to find the phrenic and vagus nerves we're not going to find the thoracic duct or the cisterna chile anywhere that I know of. Okay, thank you.